Today we're going to be talking about Natalie Holloway, a Mountain Brook High School senior who went missing back in 2005. To this day, her whereabouts remain unknown. Let's go ahead and dive into it. Natalie Holloway was born on October 21st, 1986 in Memphis, Tennessee. In the year 2000, she relocated to Alabama with her family and settled in the affluent suburb of Birmingham known as Mountain Brook. In Mountain Brook, Natalie attends Mountain Brook High School and she excels academically. Not only is Natalie a straight A student, she's also a star on her school's dance team. She had plans to pursue a pre-med degree at the University of Alabama on a full scholarship. However, her college aspirations are cut short when, at the age of 18, she traveled to Aruba with 125 of her Mountain Brook classmates and seven chaperones to celebrate their high school graduation. Once in Aruba, Natalie and her friends enjoyed days of sunbathing and snorkeling, while their nights were filled with partying. After all, they were of legal drinking age there. They frequented popular spots like Carlos and Charlie's nightclub and the Excelsior Casino, which was connected to the Holiday Inn where they stayed. It is there at the Excelsior Casino on the final night of their graduation trip that Natalie met Jorn Vandersloot, a 17-year-old Dutch man. Security camera footage captured Jorn entering the casino and engaging in a conversation with Natalie and her friends at a blackjack table. They hit it off and Natalie makes plans to meet Jorn later at Carlos and Charlie's. At the club, they drink, they dance, and they enjoy themselves alongside their friends. And when the bar closes around 1.30 a.m., Natalie was seen leaving in a silver or gray Honda with Jorn and his two friends, Deepak and Satish Kaupo. This is the last time Natalie is seen. The following day, the Mountain Brook seniors were supposed to meet in their hotel lobby to prepare for their departure from Aruba. But Natalie didn't show up. Concerned, her friends went to her room, and there they discovered her passport and her luggage, but Natalie was nowhere to be found. A chaperone on the trip contacted Natalie's mother, Beth Holloway Twitty, and she informed her about the situation. Upon hearing the news, Natalie's family immediately flies out to Aruba. They arrive later that night and accompanied with two Aruban policemen, they head over to the Vandersloot residence. Initially, Jorn denied knowing Natalie, but eventually he fessed up and he claims that he and his friends took her to the California lighthouse area because she wanted to see sharks. Oddly specific. They drop her off at her hotel, the Holiday Inn, around 2 a.m. She fell while getting out of his car. He tried to help her, but she refused. He then says as he drove away, Natalie was approached by an individual in a black shirt resembling a security guard. Less than a week after Natalie Holloway's disappearance, former hotel security guards Nick John and Abraham Jones are detained by Aruban police. However, they're released without charges eight days later. On June 9th, Jorn Vandersloot and the Calpo brothers are arrested on suspicion of kidnapping and murder. There's stories change, with the Calpo brothers claiming they dropped off Natalie and Jorn at the beach, and Jorn says that he left Natalie there and walked home. The Calpo brothers are released about a month later, but Jorn remains in jail for another two months. If all this arresting and re-arresting wasn't exhausting enough, in November they're arrested again, this time due to the discovery of new incriminating evidence. However, the evidence doesn't pan out to be much and they're released later. By the end of 2007, Aruban prosecutors officially closed the Holloway case. But a few months later, the next year, they unexpectedly announced they're reopening the case. A judge refuses to arrest Jorn still though. Also at the beginning of 2008, hidden camera footage set up by a Dutch reporter captures Jorn confessing to disposing of Natalie's body from a boat after she collapsed on the beach. I just think that I'm incredibly lucky that she's never been found. When confronted about the recording, Jorn claims he made it up. Now that same year, Jorn does a paid interview with Fox News, and he has a new disturbing story about Natalie's whereabouts. He says he sold Natalie off into sexual slavery. He was interested in me bringing him a blonde girl. Anything offered in exchange for? Yeah, he offered me money. And what did you say? I said, okay, sure. Later, he retracts that statement. Are you noticing a pattern? Unfortunately, there is some evidence that makes his latest tall tale more credible. In November 2008, Jorn is involved in a sex trafficking ring in Bangkok. He poses as a production consultant for a modeling agency and sells Thai women into prostitution in the Netherlands. Thailand was pursuing criminal charges against him at that time. Now fast forwarding to 2010, Paulus Vandersloot, Jorn's father, passed away from a heart attack while playing tennis. This event provides Jorn with the perfect opportunity for his next scheme, seeking a financial arrangement from the Holloway family. Jorn sends an email to John Q. Kelly, the Holloway's lawyer, offering to disclose the location of Natalie's body in exchange for $25,000 up front and $225,000 to follow. The lawyer accepts the offer and of course informs the FBI. About a month and a half later, Kelly arrives in Aruba with 10,000 in hand to meet Jorn. 
Yorin accepts the money and he leads him to a house where he claims his father, convenient, right? Buried Natalie in its foundation. Natalie's mom then wires an additional 15,000 to Yorin's bank account, which is in the Netherlands. And Yorin goes off secretly <laughs> to a poker tournament in Peru. It's revealed that the house Yorin had directed the lawyer to hadn't even been constructed during the time of Natalie's disappearance, which makes it impossible for her to be buried in its foundation. Furthermore, Yorin even admits that he was lying to the lawyer, which is not surprising. On May 30th, 2010, the fifth anniversary of Natalie's disappearance to the day, Yorn is involved in the murder of 21-year-old Stephanie Flores Ramirez in his hotel room in Lima, Peru. Stephanie's body is not immediately found because Yorn left instructions on the door to discourage hotel staff from entering. He then escapes to Chile and just a few days later on June 3rd, he's discovered by authorities with a newly dyed red hairdo in a taxi near Vina del la Mar. He's taken into custody and deported to Lima, Peru the next day. Back in Birmingham, Yorn is charged with extortion and wire fraud, and an arrest warrant was issued. Later that month, Yorn is indicted. He faced these charges following a federal investigation into his attempt to extort $250,000 from Natalie's mother. Despite Beth paying Yorn the $25,000 up front, authorities didn't arrest him due to lack of sufficient evidence. Two years later, Natalie's declared legally dead. There's another big thing that happened at the start of 2012 though. Yorn pleads guilty to murdering the woman in Peru. He says that Stephanie had accessed his laptop without his permission and she found information that connected him to Natalie Holloway. Yorn goes on to say from all the accusations and pressure from the case and Natalie's family making his life hard, it drove him to just go ahead and murder her. That makes sense, right? Yorn receives a 28 year prison sentence for murdering Stephanie. However, Natalie's family learns that he won't face extradition until after he finishes his murder sentence in Peru. While in prison, Yorn gets married and has a child, which is very strange, contrasting with the lives Natalie and Stephanie were denied. And in 2016, Natalie Holloway's father hires a private investigator who discovers an informant named Gabriel. Gabriel states he was once a roommate to John Ludwig, an American who was one of Jorn Vandersloot's closest friends back in 2005. According to Gabriel, Ludwig knows what happened to Natalie's body. The private investigator obtains some human bones based on the informant's information, but DNA testing reveals that they do not belong to Natalie. However, Ludwig does confess in a televised interview for a documentary series that he assisted Jorn in disposing of Natalie's body in 2010. Fast forward two years, Ludwig is in the news again, but this time it was because he tried to kidnap a woman in Florida out of her own driveway. She stabbed him in self-defense and that stab wound ended up killing Ludwig. And that brings us to May 10th, 2023. Peru officials issued an executive order allowing the temporary extradition of Yorn to the United States. And it's there in the US that he's gonna face the charges of extortion and wire fraud that we talked about earlier in this video. He'll be arraigned in federal court in Birmingham, Alabama, and then he will return to Peru once his legal proceedings are complete. As we conclude this video, exploring the perplexing case of Natalie Holloway's disappearance, we're left with both a sense of tragedy and unanswered questions. The circumstances surrounding Natalie's death and the subsequent events that followed have really left us with a web of conflicting accounts. Despite numerous investigations, arrests, and even confessions, justice has remained quite elusive for Natalie and her family. Hopefully with the latest development in this case, Natalie's family can find some much needed peace and justice for their daughter. And if you want more information on Natalie's disappearance, head over to AO.com. We have an amazing crime reporter who actually went to Aruba and covered this case. Check out Carol Robinson's articles, which take a very in-depth look at the Holloway case. As always, thank you for watching and we'll see you later. Bye.